to a thousand nights and one night. Now, when it was the twenty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the young merchant continued as follows. Now when I testified, I bear witness that there is no god save the god I heard my mistress, the handmaid, declare to the caliph. These chests, O commander of the faithful, have been committed to my charge by the lady Zubeda, and she doth not wish their contents to be seen by any one. No matter, quoth the caliph, needs must they be opened. I will see what is in them. And he cried aloud to the eunuchs, Bring the chest here before me. At this I made sure of death without benefit of doubt, and swooned away. Then the eunuchs brought the chests up to him, one after another, and he fell to inspecting the contents, but he saw in them only otters and stuffs and fine dresses, and they ceased not opening the chest, and he ceased not looking to see what was in them, finding only clothes in such matters, till none remained unopened but the box in which I was boxed. They put forth their hands to open it, but my mistress, the handmaid, made haste and said to the caliph, This one thou shalt see only in the presence of the lady Zubeda, for that which is in it is her secret. When he heard this, he gave orders to carry in the chest, so they took them up that went therein I was and bore it with the rest of the harem and set it down in the midst of the saloon. And indeed, my spittle was dried up for very fear. Then my mistress opened the box and took me out, saying, Fear not, no harm shall betide thee, now nor dread. But broaden thy breast, and strengthen thy heart, and sit thee down till the Lady Zubeda come, and surely thou shalt win thy wishes of me. So I sat down, and after a while in came ten handmaidens, virgins like moons, and ranged themselves in two rows, five facing five, and after them, Twenty other damsels, high bosomed virginity, surrounding the Lady Zubeda, who could hardly walk for the weight of her raiment and ornaments. As she drew near, the slave girls dispersed from around her, and I advanced and kissed the ground between her hands. She signed to me to sit, and when I sat before her chair, she began questioning me of my forebears and family and condition to which I made such answers that pleased her, and she said to my mistress, O nurturing of thee, O damsel, hath not disappointed us. Then she said to me, Know that this handmaiden is to us even as our own child, and she is a trust committed to thee by Allah. I again kissed the ground before her, well pleased that I should marry my mistress, and she bade me abide ten days in the palace. So I abode there ten days, during which I time I saw not my mistress, nor anybody save one of the concubines, who brought me in the morning and evening meals. After this, the Lady Zubeda came counsel with the Caliph on the marriage of her favorite handmaid, and he gave leave and assigned to her a wedding portion of ten thousand gold pieces. So the Lady Zubeda sent for the Kazi and witness who wrote our marriage contract, after which the women made ready sweet meats and rich viands and distributed them among all the odas of the harem. Thus, they did other ten days, at the end of which time my mistress went to the baths. Meanwhile, they set before me a tray of food whereon were various meats, and among those dishes, which were enough to daze the wits, was a bowl of cumin ragu containing chicken breasts, fricasseed and flavored with sugar, pistachios, musk, and rose water. Then by Allah, fair sirs, I did not long hesitate but took my seat before the ragu and fell to and ate it until I could no more. After this, I wiped my hands but forgot to wash them and sat till it drew dark and the wax candles were lighted and the singing women came in and their tambourines and proceeded to display the bride in various dresses and to carry her in procession from room to room all around the palace, getting their palms crossed with gold. Then they brought her to me and disrobed her when I found myself alone with her on the bed, I, I embraced her, hardly believing in our union, but she smelt the strong odors of the ragu upon my hands, and forthwith cried out with an exceeding loud cry at which the slave girls came, running from all her sides. I trembled with alarm, unknowing what was the matter, and the girls asked her, What aileth thee, O sister? Take this madman away from me. 
I had thought he was a man of sense. Quoth I to her, What, what makes thee think me mad? Quoth she, Thou madman, what made thee eat of cumin ragu and forget to wash thy hands? By Allah, I will requite thee of thy misconduct. Shall the like of thee come to bed with the like of me with unclean hands? Then she took her him, <clears throat> took from her side a plated scourge, and came down with it on my back, and the place where I sit till her forearms were benumbed, and I fainted away from much beating. When she said to the handmaids, Take him, and carry him to the chief of police, that he may strike off the hand wherein he ate of the cumin ragu, of which he did not wash. When I heard this, I said, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah. Wilt thou cut off my hand, because I ate of a cumin ragu, and did not wash? The handmaidens also interceded with her, and kissed her hand, saying, O oh, our sister, this man is a simpleton. Punish him not for what he hath done this nonce. But she answered, By Allah, there is no help, but that I dock him of somewhat, especially the offending member. Then she went away. And I saw no more of her for ten days, during which time she sent me meat and drink by a slave girl, who told me that she had fallen sick from the smell of the cumin ragu. After that time she came to me and said, O oh, black of face, I will teach thee how to eat cumin ragu without washing thy hands. Then she cried out to a handmaidens who pinioned me, and she took a sharp razor and cut off my thumbs and great toes, even as you see, O fair assembly. Thereupon I swooned away, and she sprinkled some powder of healing herbs upon the stumps. When the blood was staunched, I said, Never again will I eat of cumin ragu without washing my hands forty times with potash, forty times with galangal, and forty times with soap. And she took me of an oath and bound me by my covenant to that effect. When therefore you brought me with cumin ragu, my color changed, and I said to myself, It was this very dish that caused the cutting off of my thumbs and great toes. And when you forced me, I said, Needs must I fulfill the oath I have sworn. And what befell thee after this? asked those present, and he answered. When I swore to her, her anger was appeased, and I slept with her that night. We abode thus a while, till she said to me one day, Verily, the palace of the caliph is not a pleasant place for us to live in, and none ever entered it save thyself, and thou only by the grace of the lady Zubada. Now she hath given me fifty thousand dinars, adding, Take this money, and go out and buy us a fair dwelling house. So I fared forth, and bought a fine and spacious manor. Whether she removed all the wealth she owned, and what riches I had gained in steps and costly rarities, such is the cause of the cutting off of my thumbs and great toes. We ate, continued the reeve, and were returning to our homes, when there befell me with the hunchback that thou wottest of. This then is my story, and peace be with thee, quoth the king. This story is no wise more delectable than the story of the hunchback. Nay, it is even less so, and there is no help for the hanging of the whole of you. Then came forward the Jewish physician, and kissing the ground, said, O king of the age, I will tell thee an history, and more wonderful than that of the hunchback. Tell on, said the king of China. And so he began the tale of the Jewish doctor. Right marvelous was a matter which came to pass to me in my youth. I lived in Damascus of Syria, studying in my art, and one day, as I was sitting at home, behold, there came to me a mamluk from the household of the sahib, and said to me, Speak with me, my lord. So I followed him to the viceroy's house, and entering the great hall, saw at its head a couch of cedar plated with gold, whereon lay a sickly youth, beautiful withal, fairer than he could not see. I sat down by his head and prayed to the heaven for a cure, and he made me a sign with his eyes. So I said to him, O my Lord, favor me with thy hand, and safety be with thee. Then he put forth his left hand, and I marveled thereat and said, By Allah, strange that this handsome youth, the son of a great house, should so lack good manners. This can be nothing but pride and conceit. However, I felt his pulse and wrote him a prescription, and continued to visit him for ten days, at the end of which time he recovered, and went to the Haman, whereupon 
the viceroy gave me a handsome dress of honor and appointed me superintendent of the hospital, which is here in Damascus. I accompanied him to the baths, the whole of which they had kept private for his accommodation. And the servants came in to him and took off his clothes within the bath, and when he was stripped, I saw that his right hand had been newly cut off, and this was the cause of his weakliness. At this I was amazed and grieved for him. Then looking at his body, I saw in it the scarves of scourge stripes whereto he had applied unguents. I was troubled at the sight, and my concern appeared in my face. The young man looked at me, and comprehending the matter said, O oh, physician, of the age marvel not at my case. I will tell thee my story as soon as we quit the baths. Then we washed, and returning to his house, ate somewhat of food and took rest a while, after which he asked me, what sayest thou to solacing thee by inspecting the super hall? I answered, So let it be. Thereupon he ordered the slaves to carry out the carpets and cushions required and roast a lamb and bring us some fruit. They did his bidding and we ate together, he using the left hand for the purpose. After a while I said to him, Now, tell me of thy tale. O oh, physician of the age, replied he, hear what befell me knowing that I am the son of Mosul, where my grandfather died, leaving nine children, of whom my father was the eldest. All grew up and took of them wives, but none of them was blessed with offspring except my father, to whom the providence vouchsafed me. So I grew up amongst my uncles, who rejoiced in me and with exceeding joy, till I came to man's estate. One day, which happened to be a Friday, I went to the cathedral mosque of Mosul with my father and my uncles, and we prayed the congregational prayers, after which the folk went forth, except my father and uncles, who sat talking of wondrous things in foreign parts and marvelous sights of strange cities. At last they mentioned Egypt, and one of my uncles said, Travelers tell us that there is not on earth's face aught fairer than Cairo and her Nile, and these words made me long to see Cairo with my father. Whoso hath not seen Cairo hath not seen the world. Her dust is golden, and her Nile a miracle holden, and her women, oh, are fair. Puppets, beautiful pictures, her houses are palaces rare, her water is sweet and light, and her mud a commodity and a medicine beyond compare, even as said the poet in this is poetry. The Nile flood this day is the gain you own. You alone in such gain and bounties won. The Nile is my tear flood of severance, and here none is forlorn but I alone. Moreover, temperate as her air, and with fragrance blent, which surpasses aloes wood and scent, and how should it be otherwise, she being the mother of the world? And Allah favor him who wrote these lines. And I quit Cairo and her pleasurances, where can I wend to find so gladsome ways? Shall I desert the sight whose grateful sense joy every soul and call for loudest praise? Where every palace as another Eden, carpets and cushions richly wrought displays, a city wooing sight and sprite to glee, where saints meet sinner with each joys his craze, where friend meets friend, by providence united, in greeny garden and in palmy maze, people of Cairo, and by Allah's doom, I fare with you in thoughts I won always. Whisper not Cairo in the ear in the ear of the Zephyr, lest for her, like of garden sense, he weave her. And if your eye saw her earth, and the adornment thereof with bloom, and the purfling of it with all manner blossoms in the isles of the Nile, and how much is therein of widespread and goodly prospect, and if you bend your sights upon the Abyssian pond, your glance would not revert from the scene quit of wonder. For nowhere would you behold the fellow of that lovely view. And indeed, the two arms of the Nile embrace much luxuriant verdure, as the white of the eye encompasses black or like filigreed silver surrounding chrysaloids. And divinely gifted was the poet who thereat said these couplets. By the Assyrian pond, O oh, day divine, in morning twilight and in sunny shade, the water pris prisoned in its verdurous walls, like sabers, 
flashes before a shrinken ein, and the garden sat we while it drains, so draught with purple sides dyed finest fine. The stream is rippled by the hands of clouds, we too a rippling on our rugs recline, passing pure wine, and whoso leaves us there shall ne'er arise from falls and woe's design, draining long draughts from long and brimming bowls, administering thirst, only medicine, wine. And what is there to compare with the rasad, the observatory, and its charms, whereof every viewer, as he approaches, saith, Verily, this spot is specialized with all manner of excellence, and if thou speak of the night of Nile full, give the rainbow and distribute it. And if thou behold the garden at eventide, with the cool shades sloping far and wide, a marvel thou wilt see, and wast inclined to Egypt in ecstasy. And wert thou by Cairo's riverside, when the sun is sinking, and the stream dons mail coat and haberajan over its other vestments, thou would be quickened to new life by its gentle zephyrs, and by all sufficient shade. So spake he, and the rest fell to describing Egypt and her Nile. As I heard their accounts, my thoughts dwelt upon the subject, and when after talking their fill all arose and went their ways, I lay down to sleep that night, but sleep came not, because of my violent longing for Egypt, and neither meat pleased me, nor drink. After a few days, my uncles equipped themselves for a trade journey to Egypt, and I wept before my father till he made me ready for me to fitting merchandise, and he consented to my going with them, saying, However, let him not enter Cairo, but leave him to sell his wares at Damascus. So I took leave of my father, and we fared forth from Mosul, and gave not over traveling, till we reached Aleppo, where we halted certain days. Then we marched onwards till we made it to Damascus, and we found her city as though she were a paradise, abounding in trees and streams and birds and fruits and, and birds of all kinds. We alighted at one of the cons, where my uncles tarried a while, selling and buying, and they bought and sold also on my account, each Durham turning a profit of five on prime cost, which pleased me mightily. After this, they left me alone and set their faces each Egypt wards, while I abode in Damascus, where I had hired from a jeweler for two dinars a month a mansion whose beauties would beggar the tongue. When I remained, eating, drinking, spending what monies I had on hand, till one day, as I was sitting at the door of my house, behold, there came up a young lady clad in the costliest raiment, never saw my eyes richer. I winked at her. And she stepped inside without hesitation and stood within. I entered with her and shut the door upon myself and her, whereupon she raised her face veil and threw off her mantilla, where I found her like a pictured moon of rare, marvelous loveliness, and love of her got hold of my heart. So I rose and brought a tray of the most delicate edibles and fruits, and what so befitted the occasion, and we ate and played, and after that we drank wine till it turned our heads. Then I lay with her the sweetest of nights, and in the morning I offered her ten gold pieces. When her face lowered and her eyebrows wrinkled, and shaking with wrath, she cried, Fie upon thee, O my sweet companion! Dost thou deem that I covet thy money? Then she took out from the bosom of her shift Fifteen dinars, and laying them before me, she said, By Allah, unless thou take them, I will never come back to thee. So I accepted them, and she said to me, O oh, my beloved, expect me again in three days' time, when I will be with thee before sunset and supper tide, and do thou prepare for us with these dinars the same entertainment as yesternight. So saying, she took leave of me and went away. All my senses went with her. On the third day she came again, clad in stuff weft with gold wire, and wearing raiment and ornaments finer than before. I had prepared the place for her ere she arrived, and the repast was ready. So we ate and drank and lay together as we had done till the morning, when she gave me another fifteen gold pieces, and promised to come again in three days. Accordingly, I made ready for her, and at the appointed time she presented herself to me more richly dressed than the first or the second occasion, and said to me, 
oh my lord am i not beautiful yea by allah thou art answered i and she went on wilt thou allow me to bring with me a fine young lady fairer than i and younger in years that she may play with us and that she may laugh and make merry and rejoice her heart for she hath said she's been very sad this last time past and hath asked me to take her out and let her spend the night abroad with us yea by allah i replied and we drank till the wine turned our heads and slept till the morning when she gave me another fifteen dinars saying add something to thy usual provision on account of the young lady who will come with me then she went away and on the fourth day i made ready the house as usual and soon after sunset behold she came up accompanied by another damsel carefully wrapped in her mantilla they entered and sat down and when i saw them i repeated these verse how dear is our day and how lucky our lot when the cynic's away with his tongue's malign when love and delight and the swimming of heads send cleverness trotting the best boon of wine when full moon shines from the cloudy veil and the branchlet sways in her greens that shine when the red rose mantles and freshest cheek and the narcissus openeth his lovesick eyne when pleasure with those i love is so sweet when friendship with those i love is complete i rejoiced to see them and lighted the candles after receiving them with gladness and delight they doffed their heavy outer dresses and the new damsel uncovered her face when i saw that she was like the moon at its full never beheld i aught more beautiful then i rose and set meat and drink before them and we ate and we drank and i kept giving mouthfuls to the newcomer crowning her cup and drinking with her till the first damsel waxing inwardly jealousy asked her by allah is she not more delicious than i or to i answered i by the lord it is my wish that thou lie with her this night and i am thy mistress but she is our visitor upon my head be it and my eyes then she rose and spread the carpets for our bed and i took the young lady and lay with her that night till morning when i awoke and found myself wet as i thought with sweat i sat up and tried to arouse the damsel but when i shook her by the shoulders my hand became crimson with blood and her head rolled off the pillow thereupon my senses fled and i cried out loud saying oh a powerful protector grant me thy protection then finding her neck had been severed i sprung up and the world waxed black before my eyes and i looked for the lady my former love but could not find her so i knew that it was she who had murdered the damsel in her jealousy and said there is no majesty there is no might save allah all the glorious the great what is to be done now i considered a while then doffing my clothes dug a hole in the middle of the courtyard wherein i laid the murder girl with her jewelry and gold ornaments and throwing back the earth on her replaced the slabs of the marble pavement after this i made the goosle or the total abulation and put on pure clothes then taking what money i had left locked up the house and summoned courage and went to its owners to whom i paid a year's rent saying i'm going to join my uncles in cairo presently i set out and journeyed to egypt four gathered with my uncles who rejoiced in me and i found that they had made an end of selling their merchandise they asked me what is the cause of thy coming and i answered i longed for a sight of you but did not let them know that i had any money with me i abode with them a year enjoying the pleasures of cairo and her nile and squandering the rest of my money in feasting and carousing till the time drew near for the departure of my uncles when i fled from them and hid myself they made inquiries and sought for me and hearing no tidings i said he will have gone back to damascus when they departed i came forth from my hiding place and abode in cairo three years until naught remained of my money now every year i used to send the rent of damascus house to its owner until at last i had nothing left but enough to pay him for one year's rent and my breast was straightened so i traveled to damascus and alighted the house whose owner the jeweler was glad to see me and i found everything locked up as i had left it i opened the closets took out my clothes and necessaries and came upon beneath the carpet bed whereon i had laid that night with the girl who had been beheaded 
a gold necklace set with ten gems of passing beauty. I took it up and, cleansing it of the blood, sat gazing upon it and wept a while. Then I abode in the house two days, and on the third I entered the hammock and changed my clothes. I had no money by me now, so Satan whispered temptation to me that the decree of destiny be carried out. Next day, I took the jeweled necklace to the bazaar and handed it to the broker, who made me sit down in the shop of the jeweler, my landlord, and bade me patience till the market was full, when he carried off the ornament and proclaimed it for sale, privily and without my knowledge. The necklet was priced at 2,000 dinars, but the broker returned to me and said, this collar is of copper, a mere counterfeit after the fashion of the Franks, and a thousand dirhams have been bidden for it. Yes, I answered. I knew it could be copper, as if we had made it for a certain person that we might mock her. Now my wife hath inherited it, and we wish to sell it. So go and take over the thousand dirhams. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. And so too I finish for today. Until tomorrow.